Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is the story of someone getting back at someone with revenge, after being wronged. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, I filed a lawsuit against the company where I worked. The second story, guy left the apartment, after the help of a friend. The third story, I woke up my neighbor, after he didn't let me sleep. The first story is malicious compliance that almost got me fired. Revenge is unexpected, but oh so sweet. One of the most entertaining things in a customer service or dealing with the public role is the husband and wife dynamic. Sometimes the husband is the more reasonable of the two. Sometimes the wife is the calm and understanding one. Other times they're both a bunch of F apples. On this particular day, I had a lovely wife with an extremely aggressive husband come into the warehouse and pick out a storage ottoman they wanted. Now, the storage ottomans were a frustrating item, as the metal mechanisms that allowed the lid to be opened and shut made the ottomans extremely heavy, needing at least two people to lift it. Naturally, aggressive D-bag husband flat out refuses to pay delivery for his ottoman he's just purchased. In his words, we'll just pick it up. Yeah, right buddy, more like we'll drive our small car around back and your warehouse staff can do it. The husband and wife concluded the sales process in store and the sales associate passes a copy of the paperwork on to me. I scan over it and make sure they've ticked off and signed off on the terms and conditions. That all clearance sales are final. That all clearance sales are as is. That warehouse staff and sales staff are not covered under any insurance for loading or unloading customers goods and customers are responsible for the pickup of any items they purchase or order etc etc. The customer pulls their car around and it's a smallish car, but should be fine. The husband walks over, and I show him where his freshly bagged ottoman is and hand him a trolley. Man, what's that for? Me, to load your ottoman, sir. Man, no, 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 you're helping me. Me, there's two of you, sir, you'll be fine. Man, well then I'm canceling my order and filing a complaint against your company. I just sigh. I don't want to cost this salesperson a sale, but my gut is trying to tell me something. I quickly go into the office and grab a release form, which we use for anyone picking up clearance, but make a few handwritten notes of my own. I bring the paperwork back out and show it to the customer. Me, sir, could you fill out your full name, contact details, and initial these handwritten comments and sign this release? Man, why? Me, it just says that you're happy to have me help you load up your ottoman and that if anything happens, you won't hold us liable. Man, wow. You guys sure take things seriously. I just smile as he signs the document. I pass it to my offsider, asking him to make a few photocopies for the sales associate, the manager, the area manager, and the general manager. The wife grabs one end, along with her husband, and I grab the other end. We all lift it up and begin walking it toward the trunk of the car. The wife seems fine, but the husband is struggling. He keeps asking to put it down so he can take a break. We pick up the ottoman again, and as we're just about to reach the car, the husband lets go of his end, the lounge tips to the right, I lurch forward, and the ottoman smashes into the back of their car, taking out the right-hand side taillight. The wife immediately starts laughing, as the husband loses his SH. He's inspecting the damage, and is looking at me with wild eyes, wanting me to offer him an admission of guilt. I calmly stand there as they load up their ottoman and drive away. Is that the end? Absolutely not. The next day, the husband calls the store. He is filing a lawsuit against the company for damages and has provided HR and head office with excessive estimates. Immediately I'm called into the boardroom upstairs. There's the general manager, the manager, HR, and a legal representative who's there for the shareholders. GM and HR explain to me that they're not risking a lawsuit, that they're going to pay for this guy's car, and that they're going to fire me. Without a word, I take out the document the customer signed. I hand it to the HR rep, who hands it to the GM. Me. The customer signed off on a release form after I explained that the company didn't cover or expect me to load his goods. The customer clearly stated here that if I helped him, he was absolving me of any liability, including vehicle damage. The GM hands the document over to the lawyer, who scans it, and his face changes. They know they can't do anything. Me. I couldn't help but add this. Ask your lawyer over there. I did exactly what the customer asked me to do. I helped them. It was the customer who dropped his end of the ottoman. He caused the damage, not me. There's silence in the room. I turn and walk out. I've had enough. I go to the warehouse, grab my bag, 
get a bus home and play some Dead Space 2. There was aftermath. I went to my best friend, who is a lawyer, and put my own lawsuit against the company for a variety of issues and also sent a few emails out for the company to be investigated. The Aftermath and Revenge The Aftermath and my legal battle, trying to keep it vaguish and not as detailed just in case. After this BS transpired, I got together with my best friend and we started looking into the company and the safety procedures they were breaking. The fact they were not hiring enough staff to safely lift items. No lift access in the store, which breaches safety laws regarding moving heavy items and also breaches a few laws around access for people on wheelchairs or disabilities. No overtime pay when people are forced to work OT. Now a few other things that my best friend uncovered in his investigation. General manager ran a special promotion during my time there. That proceeds would go to a cancer charity. And guess what? The $50,000 meant to go to charity disappeared and somehow found its way into his bank account. There was also some claims made about the furniture that were false. Made in Italy. Made in China. 15-year warranty, 2-year warranty, unlimited cleaning for the entirety of your owning the sofa, claims were always denied, stuff like that. Armed with all this, my lawyer and I went to a mediation, wherein their legal team tried to pressure me into not taking a payout of my wage, my holiday pay, and a payout of all my other benefits. If they made this lawsuit against me, go away. Imagine their surprise when my lawyer began bringing up all the safety violations, staff wage discrepancies, not to mention the outright lies and stealing carried out by management. The meeting was quickly postponed, and the lawyer for my ex-employer and the general manager asked for a private conversation outside. They asked me what it would take for me to not go ahead in court. My lawyer asked for all my benefits paid and to pay out the rest of the year, as if I had been working a five-day week. They deliberated for 15 minutes before they agreed. What they didn't agree on is that we couldn't send off the violations to all the necessary government bodies. Last I heard, the GM and management team were fired, and the company was fined $250,000. The next story is, won't pay rent or move out, annual bug bomb time. This is a story about what my friend KP did to help his buddy get rid of a roommate who just wouldn't move out. What you have to understand is, KP is the sort of guy who will put far more effort into a scam than honest work would ever take. He lives for the flim flam. In grade school, he had every puke ray and remote control fart box they sold. We spent our teenage years driving around to fast food restaurants and telling the manager that they got our order wrong in order to wheeze some free food, or disconnecting the odometer on his mom's scooter so we could joyride undetected. KP's family was wealthy, but that didn't matter. His car's plates were always counterfeit. He was the guy who would hook up your cable. He ran a side business, replicating of-age stamps that all the local bars used. He ran a high school speakeasy in his spare bedroom. He forged a dealer's license to buy his RV wholesale. And to this day, every time he walks into a restaurant, he goes right over to the server's counter and grabs someone else's chicken's fingers and brings them to the table. Nobody said these stories had to involve ethical people. He dropped out of college first semester to go to one of those get-rich-quick seminars in Vegas and actually got it rich with one of those legal scams. You know, the bounce check mini lean one? So needless to say, he doesn't have to work and has actually spent his time pursuing one grift or another, from diamond cutting to inventing a new kind of lawnmower. They never go anywhere because his interest dries up quicker than the thousand dollars worth of dead fish in his saltwater aquarium. I wouldn't be surprised if right now, he was soaking the labels off of some wine bottles or selling some counterfeit calamari. He lives for the flim flam, but he's also a volunteer firefighter and that plays a small role. His buddy Schlimazal got into a year-long lease for a one-bedroom apartment Shortly after that, he and his girlfriend got pretty serious, and they decided to buy a house. He subletted his apartment to a guy who I'll call the guy on our couch, Gooch. Gooch didn't have a job and never paid rent, ever. Schlemezel begged and pleaded and threatened. Nope, Gooch didn't budge. He didn't have a job and rarely left the house, just smoked pot all day and played video games. Schlemezel was living with his girlfriend and trying to apply for loans. Unpaid rent would look bad on his credit. He appealed to the landlord to initiate an eviction, but the landlord said, your problem, F you, pay me. A few months went by and he's paying this guy's rent and getting a lot of empty promises and getting nowhere. So he calls KP. This is the sort of phone call KP lives for. He springs into action. First thing he does is buy one of those pre-made websites that he sets up like a fake exterminator company. He gets them a 1-800 number and routes it to Schlemezel's phone. Then he goes to Home Depot and buys Tyvek suits, masks, roach traps, and some of those little wand sprayers that exterminators use. He enlists the help of a friend, Minch. Then he rents a U-Haul. 
He grabs a toy he has called a thermal imaging camera, or TIC, that firefighters use to find sources of heat in thick smoke. It looks like a very official piece of equipment. Then they suit up and knock on Gooch's door. Annual bug bomb, they say. Gooch comes to the door in a thick haze of smoke, eyes squinty. Huh? Annual bug bomb, they say. Have you lived here a year? They knew he hadn't. Yep, every year we got a bug bomb your place. Here's our card. You can call the office if you want. It helped a little that being a filthy stoner, Gooch did have a roach problem. So he let them in, and they start spraying the corners and scanning the walls with the TIC. Yep, you can see their tracks everywhere. You got roaches in here. At this point, Mensch is taking long strips of roach traps and ripping them off the strip and frisbeeing them into the corners. But he's got gloves on and he's having trouble tearing them. Gooch is getting suspicious. These guys are exterminators and this guy can't tear a roach trap off of a strip? In a stroke of genius, Mensch exclaims, I hate when they give me the blue ones, and throws the strip down. They convince Gooch that he must vacate the apartment for 24 hours. Go stay with a friend. Oh, you have a cat? Well, the cat can't stay. You gotta take it. So as soon as the coast is clear, the operation begins. They back the U-Haul up to the door and flag down a passing big guy. Hey, you wanna make 50 bucks helping us move? Then they proceed to move all of Gucci's stuff into the U-Haul. A guy like that? What does he have? Some dirty sheets on a futon mattress, a TV, a slab of canned beans and ramen packs, a litter box that hasn't been changed since the Nixon administration. When that's done, Schlemazel, who's been manning the phones, sweeps in with a digital camera and takes pictures of the empty apartment. He's scheduled an appointment with the locksmith, who arrives and changes the locks. They all head to a storage facility with the U-Haul and unload Gucci's stuff into a locker. Schlemazel takes a picture of that too. Schlemazel goes to Kinko's and prints out the digital pictures of the empty apartment and the full storage unit along with a sign. Gooch returns to the apartment the next day to find a sign on the door that says your stuff has all been moved into storage. Meet me at the storage unit at this place in time with your back rent to get your stuff back. On the door is a picture of the empty apartment and a full locker. His keys don't work. At the meeting time, Gooch shows up at the cops. He's called and told them that someone has stolen all of his stuff and is extorting him. KP explains the real situation to the police and says that they may be interested in certain items among Gucci's stuff that resemble heavily used tobacco pipes and hookahs. The cops, realizing exactly what has gone down, shake their heads. They know they can't prove that the contraband is Gucci's. They say KP can't extort the back rent this way. Then they issue Gucci a summons for filing a false police report. Schlemazel never got his back rent, but he did get his subletter out. The next story is, Wake me up with fireworks at 4 a.m.? Now Alexa will wake you up with fireworks. I work a normal 8 to 5 schedule, and I'm usually up by 6 a.m. to walk the dogs and get the day started. My roommate, on the other hand, works evenings as a waiter, and it's not unusual for him to come home past midnight, especially on service industry nights, when him and co-workers all hit the bars. Then he gets to sleep in till noon while I'm heading out to work. Normally he's pretty good about staying quiet, but on this night I got woken up at 4 a.m. on a Monday morning to the loud boom of an artillery shell firework, and then another and then one more for good measure. Since I couldn't get back to sleep before I normally wake up, I spent time thinking about petty revenge. Right before I left for work, I put a wet towel into the very, very squeaky dryer near his room, and then asked Alexa to start playing fireworks sounds at full volume two hours later. Yes, there is a fireworks skill that Alexa can learn. So he'll probably have to stop the dryer or listen to his squeak for an hour. And then about the time he's back asleep, Alexa starts playing fireworks sounds at full volume and directed at his room for 20 minutes straight. And by then the dogs will be up and awake and be wanting out of crates and outside and such. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Have a good one.